Welcome to the Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2024. The Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2024 is a collaboration between Pro Bono SG, the five community development councils, NUS Faculty of Law, SUSS School of Law, SMU School of Law, the Singapore Corporate Council Association Pro Bono Chapter, and the Singapore Association of Social Workers, supported by the People's Association. I am Jolina, a fellow animal lover and your host for this webinar. Today's webinar is Furry Friends, Fair Treatment, Understanding Animal Welfare Laws. First, some housekeeping methods. Today, we will be using Pigeon Hole for our live Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar and also upvote any questions that interest you. If you have a smartphone or tablet with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode, which is law at CDC 2402, as shown on the slide. Alternatively, you can click on the link share in the cha cha chat function to launch Pigeonhole Live. If you are viewing this webinar on your desktop or laptop, you should receive an invitation to launch Pigeonhole. Please note that today's discussion is not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today, Sadana Rai and Aarti Sankar. Sadana Rai was called to the bar in 2013. She started her legal career at Drew and Napier LLC under Mr. Davinder Singh SC. In June 2015, she joined the inaugural batch of the class fellowship as the sixth class fellow and was there till she was off offered the class advocate role in 2017. In her five years as at class, she has appeared before both the Supreme Court and the State Courts and has secured acquittals and succeeded on appeals. In recognition of her exceptional work, she was commended by the SAL Selection Committee of the Joseph Grimberg Outstanding Youth Advocate Award. Sadana has shared her thoughts on practice matters in her Singapore Law Gazette, Law Gazette article in October 2020. She also sits on the management committee of the SPCA. Aarti Sankar has been the executive director of SPCA since November 2021. She oversees the daily operations of the shelter, a 24-hour rescue hotline, Singapore's only community animal clinic, and its engagement and advocacy efforts to strengthen laws and policies relating to animals. Prior to joining the SPCA, she spent a decade at the People's Association, where she led key projects, including the Specialist Community Club, and served as the constituing co constituency director at Marsling. Arthi holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from NUS. Sadana and Arthi, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. This is an overview of what we'll be covering today. First, we'll be briefly covering what the relevant animal welfare laws in Singapore. Then we'll discuss how animal abuse cases and neglect cases are handled and the role of animal welfare organizations. Next, we'll explore some key challenges in handling animal welfare cases. And then we'll cover laws on animal-related businesses. Our panelists will also provide some practical tips on what to do if you suspect or witness some possible ab animal abuse or neglect cases. And lastly, we'll take some questions received through the pigeonhole. So now we'll go into animal welfare laws in Singapore. The applicable law in Singapore is found in the Animals and Birds Act 1965. And this was last reviewed 10 years ago in 2014. Um, there are two main laws in Singapore are Section 41C, which is the duty of care of animal owners and Section 42, which is cruelty to animals. Section 41C applies to the owners of the animals, while Section 42 applies to any person. Breach of any of these laws are criminal in nature. And this brings us to the question, who is considered an owner of an animal? Is it based on the microchip? Is it based on who bought the animal? Now, according to the Act, an owner of an animal is defined as someone including a person in charge of an animal. And it further defined th this as someone, whether it's permanently or on a temporary basis, has custody or control over the animal. This includes anyone who handles the animal in the course of their employment. I will not be going into we will not be going into detail on what ownership entails, but Sadana, perhaps you can bring us through some important points about this definition of ownership and this idea of duty of care of animal owners. 
Thanks, Jolina. So I think it's exactly what you said. It's a person who is in charge of the animal or who has custody or control of the animal. I think what's important to recognize here is that the law looks at animals as chattel. It's basically property. And the the idea behind it is how does a person own that property? And so the definition, as you as you rightly pointed out, would be if the animal is under that person's supervision or care, even if it's temporary, there is a duty to care for that animal. And so ownership is not defined as because you pay for it or because you register the microchip, you are therefore the owner. In a in an in a informal sense, a non-legalistic way, perhaps that may be what ownership means to the layperson. But from the eyes of the law, ownership means someone who has custody or control of the animal. Mm. So if let's say a cat walks into my house and is injured, am I considered the the owner of the animal? Well, if it's if the cat has just walked into your house, you're not considered to be the owner of the animal. Um, but you're also not allowed to ill-treat the animal or put it out of its misery. The ideal thing to do would be to call for assistance from the SPCA or um, Acres even, um, or NParks as well. Um, there are laws surrounding the abuse of animals, whether they are in your custody or not. And I think those are separate laws that may govern what to do when an injured or stray animal walks into your house. So the laws uh, protecting animals don't only apply if you're an owner in the legal sense. They also apply to the average person on the street that interacts with animals uh, as well. So I think there's a very recent case that everyone is talking about, which is the groomer case where a dog died in the care of the groomer. So in this case, is the groomer considered the owner? Well, um, the, the groomer is considered to be the person who has custody or control of the animal. And so the groomer has a responsibility to ensure that um, the animal is well taken care of and it's not subject to any form of neglect or abuse. And in fact, I think the SPCA's website has some very good guidelines as to how to choose your groomers. And I mean, Arti, I, I leave it to you to go into that. But one of the things that really got to me is the degree of um, investigation that you would do into the groomer's out, uh, you know, uh, uh, shop and whether the person has CCTV, which you can have access to, whether the person, you know, uh, 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 has a um, employee that's there at all times, for example, and all of these things you would do if you were sending your child to kindergarten or if you were sending your child to daycare. And so very similar types of uh, 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 checks and balances you would also look at when you were sending your pet to, if you are sending your pet to a groomer. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges, um, and I, of course we're going to cover that later when we talk about animal-related businesses, um, is that there are no licensing conditions at this juncture for groomers and for trainers, although they have the same level of accountability as a pet border or even as a pet shop or a pet breeder. Um, so one of the biggest challenges is that there's, there isn't that one penalty that um, you would expect for them to have their licenses revoked. It's also very difficult for a member of public to go and search and find out which uh, groomer is the best groomer, you know, who is the most credible. So you can look at the SPCA's website, as Sadhana had mentioned. Um, a lot of it comes from word of mouth recommendations, which may not be the most trustworthy as well, but you will have to ensure that they give you that sort of, uh, you know, assurance that they will let you check in, make sure that there are CCTVs that you can access, uh, that your pets will not be left alone as well. I just wanted to add two more points on this concept of ownership of an animal. Um, I think a lot of times we hire, well, not, not everyone does it, but we have helpers in the house that take care of animals. And then the question is, do these helpers owe a duty of care? The definition of someone who has custody or control, whether permanently or temporarily, includes people who have custody of, of control of the animal in the course of that person's employment. Right, So whether it's a groomer or if it's even a, a helper, if the, the animal is in their control and they are meant to be caring for it, the duty is imposed upon them. That's the first thing. The second thing I thought it'd be interesting to highlight is, especially in cases of divorce, and I would refer to the uh, webinar we held last year, the court doesn't just look on look at 
who paid for the dog or who registered the dog. The court also looks at, for example, who's been taking care of the dog, who was closer or more attached to the dog and uh, rather who the dog is closer or more attached to, um, who would be more able to uh, take care of the dog and attend to the dog's needs, for example, what the home environment for the dog is going to look like and what should be done in the overall best interests of the dog. This is actually a very novel approach in a divorce case. Uh, that um, The case is that of Tan Hui. And I think it's a very interesting approach because it really relooks really at what ownership means, right? It's not just because I buy, it's my property. I think it's it's foraying a little bit into what's in the best interest of the animal. And that um, kind of redefines the concept of ownership, I feel. Okay. Thank you, Sadana, for that. So I think, as mentioned, we will not go too much into this topic of ownership. But if you're interested to learn more about pet ownership matters in Singapore, including what happens in the event of a divorce or a bad breakup, please watch the following webinar. The YouTube link will be shared in the chat function for everyone to have a look. Okay, so now we'll move on to animal welfare protection. So perhaps, Sadana, you can share about the investigation process and some practical aspects of how it's done and... Um, and and you know. Okay, so I think as defense counsel, I, I will I will declare my uh, interests here. Um, I I do uh fight against charges that are uh, sometimes brought against errant animal, uh, pet owners who may be derelict in their duty of care, or can sometimes be even involved in abuse. Right, so some of them um step forward to say that you know. Um, there are these deficiencies in their cases. And that's how I can highlight that, you know, the investigation process has to be very thorough in order to establish a charge. It's not that easy for the authorities or for the prosecutors to establish or to found such a charge without the evidence. It's not the same thing as saying, as a, you know, if you, if you hit a human being, the human being can tell you, on this date, at this time, this person hit me and it, it's, it's given rise to these injuries and there's a direct relationship between the person's actions and the injury so you can establish causation right but i think um, when it comes to investigations for 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 animal related abuse it tends to be very difficult to establish a direct relationship so for example one such case that i addressed uh, or rather i assisted uh, an accused person on involved the abandonment of a sick dog um, at the void deck, right? And we were able to establish that he had abandoned the dog because there was CCTV footage. What we weren't able to establish is whether, because the dog had a pre-existing uh, illness, how much of the dog's inju injuries arose because of that pre-existing illness versus how much of it arose because of neglect versus how much of it arose because of the abandonment, right? Um, so the link is not as clear. Um, and so one of the first few things that we tend to look out for on both sides, actually, prosecution and defense, would be whether there are any post-mortem results, any uh, vet reports. We tend to look for video footages. We tend to look for um, statements from accused persons or any witnesses in the area who would have observed um, how the dog was, which is why it's so important to speak up when you see animals being abused. Or if you even have a slight inkling that something is happening, it's always important to speak up. Um, nowadays, with the uh, you know camera phone being so widely available, a lot of people take videos as well, and that kind of uh, is is very useful in the process of investigations. And it's the collation of this type of physical evidence that allows for prosecution to take place. So. To me, the investigation process tends to be a bit complicated, especially where animals cannot speak up for themselves. There is an interesting concept that I think I'll let leave Artie to talk about, which is where you, if you get manage to bring a charge against the accused person, how do you assess the kind of pain that the animal is, is feeling, right? And I think there are some studies about, or rather in some jurisdictions, they are exploring this concept of an impact statement from the animal that is prepared by the vet or that is prepared by um, an animal welfare group. Um, and it takes into account the established or the, the literature, the scientific literature that talks about the kind of pain that an animal would go through and then tries to assess what kind of uh, sentence should be imposed because of the kind of pain that the animal is going through. 
Um, I think one of the most important things that we should also note is that most of the cases that we are dealing with in Singapore actually involve neglect of your duties as a pet owner. Um, and sometimes that is very, very hard to prove because it happens behind closed doors. Um, so one of the things uh, people always ask us is, you know, uh, why can't you, you know, take this owner to court because they've not been able to uh, take proper care. I see the dog, the dog is malnourished. Uh, it is very, very challenging because you need to be able to prove that the animal did not have any medical or health issues. Uh, first, more importantly, you even need to give us access to enter the home. A lot of people think SPCA has the enforcement powers for us to access uh, these homes. In fact, uh, we do not. We actually need a cooperative owner if not the authorities have to come in. And like Sadhana mentioned, unnecessary pain and suffering, right? So the laws are quite clear in that it is unnecessary pain and suffering. I don't know what is necessary pain and suffering to begin with, uh, but more importantly, how do you actually define what is necessary, what is unnecessary and a lot of animals conceal their pain really well as well. So it becomes extremely challenging for us to do that. So in certain countries, they do have um, you know, animal welfare groups and scientists, researchers coming together to actually determine you know, uh, how much of pain or suffering an animal would have gone through, what was the damage. They've even been able to do some calculations in terms of like monetary restitution uh, where it's necessary as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we are there yet in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not seen such statements coming up uh, and very often um, I'm not even sure whether vets are actually invited to give um, their statements. I've seen it in specific cases uh, where there is very long drawn out cases of neglect so it is a bit challenging now to advocate mm. for the animal. I, th I think one of um, one of the questions that people will also wonder is what if you know the vet recommends that you know we need to put the, the, the animal down like like I think previously there was this case where there was a, a a Singapore special that was very aggressive and the adopter couldn't handle the behavior and the vet was like you can either give it up for adoption or put it down and eventually that dog was put down. So in that case, how do we measure the the necessity of putting the dog down? And if it's you know peacefully through through that through a vet, is does that affect you know whether or not there's some form of abuse there? So I think that's Loki's case. Um, and I think one of the key issues there was that the animal welfare group involved was not informed or, you know, they did not have sufficient time for them to be able to take back the dog and for them to be able to rehome the dog. Ever since Loki's case, um, AVS has actually come up with a new uh, guideline that is the rehoming and adoption work group guideline. So this means that if you adopted an animal from the SPCA and you can no longer care for that animal, I am obligated to take back the animal from you. Um, so that is one thing, right? Um, number two is, I guess, with vets and euthanasia, it's always going to be a very complex issue. Uh, personally, and I think for the SPCA, we always feel that euthanasia should only be used as a means when you have to end the pain and suffering for an animal. So it's often in cases where they're terminally ill, uh, there's very, very poor quality of life. We cannot see a treatment upfront for them. Uh, we rarely would uh, advise it, uh, especially if there has not been sufficient attempts made in terms of training as well. Uh, so I feel that a lot of these things could have been addressed early into the adoption by ensuring that you send the animals for proper training, socialization as well. So it's quite challenging, I think, uh, because you know who gets to decide whether or not uh, this is the end of the journey for that particular animal but at least now there's some kind of a structure that you can mm. return this animal back to the animal welfare group. I thought also it'd be important to highlight the provision of 41C because it's 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 framed in such a subjective way that a lot of times as defense counsel <laughs> I can argue that you know it is reasonable you know I, and, 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 and I'll be quite candid I don't take on many of such cases because you need to have a certain degree of conviction to argue this. But for example, the provision states that you must take reasonable steps to ensure that the animal is provided with adequate and suitable food and water, taking into account its dietary needs. The animal is provided with adequate shelter, whatever that means. Is being on a balcony adequate shelter? You know, um, The animal is not kept in confinement, conveyed, lifted, carried, or handled in a manner or position that subjects the animal to unreasonable and unnecessary pain or suffering. I Like Arti, I don't know what is unreasonable or unnecessary pain. To me, it's just 
I step on my dog's paw and I already start to cry because I'm like the poor thing is in so much pain, you know. But that that that's really yeah. not what this 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 provision is intended to cover. The animal is protected from and rapidly diagnosed with any significant injury or disease. What does that mean? You know, sometimes some people believe that instead of bringing my dog to a vet and subjecting it to chemotherapy, I rather my dog go through the natural process of cancer and pass on peacefully. You know, my dog is just afraid of the vet, right? So what does this mean? The, the the provision also states that you must not abandon the animal or cause or permit the animal to be abandoned, whether permanently or temporary, without reasonable cause or excuse. And 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 you know, to the layman, like what is what does this mean? Is there ever a reasonable cause or excuse to be abandoning an animal? Right. So there's there's a whole host of of uh, possibilities which, you know, and 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 I mean just to be devil's advocate, I think. We won't know until we put ourselves in the position of someone who who has to do that, right? Sometimes they cannot afford um medical attention for the for the animal, and they hope that if I put the animal in the void deck, someone will take pity and bring the animal to the vet. We don't know, right? So I think I think there are all these possibilities, and I think um um the last last part of 41C which states you must take reasonable steps to ensure the animal is cared for in accordance with the codes of animal welfare applicable to the animal. Who reads the codes of animal welfare? I do. Yeah, okay. So in your course of, 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 of work, right? Or like me, when I'm reading it because I'm curious and yeah. it applies to me. But I think a lot of pet owners and the average pet owner most certainly won't read the code of animal welfare and figure out what the, the, the their obligations are. So I think we the duty in and of itself, it's not very well known to everybody. But I would call upon people to just, it's humanity. Mm. You know, it just, the dog is thirsty, he needs water. You get thirsty, you need water. You know, mm. food, um, 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 housing, that type of thing, right? So I think it's just applying some yeah. basic common sense. Ultimately, I think, especially when it comes to duty of care uh, for a pet owner, you decided, you made this conscious decision to bring an animal into your family. I think you deserve, uh, that that animal deserves, um, you know, all the care that they require. I always tell people this and it doesn't go down very well, which is that owning a pet is not a birthright. Um, you know, and I also do believe that some people should not be allowed to keep pets ever because of the way they've treated them in the past. But actually, I wanted to jump to just say there was a very interesting question uh, on pigeonhole about duty of care. Mm. Um, and that is really uh, what duty of care is legally required if a cat or a dog falls and dies from a high-rise building. This is something that we see quite often. Um, and, you know, is there a protective mesh required to ensure safety? So I've actually raised this question a few times to the authorities because we see cases of um, falls from height and they often end in very, very bad uh, situations. In a week, we can see about six cats that fall from height and often there needs to be amputation if they even survive to begin wow. with. So I've asked the authorities before, right? Like, could I actually say someone has failed in the duty of care because their cat continues to fall? And there's an easy solution, which is a mesh. Mm -hmm. um, so we do ensure that everybody who adopts a cat from us meshes their, their windows. The new cat licensing framework does not require you to mesh your windows, but it requires you to keep your cat safely indoors at all times. Mm. So the, long, the, the short answer is no, somebody will not actually be, be penalised for this because um, there is no sort of like the cat must have fallen on its own, mm -hmm. right? Like they didn't push the cat out of the window. But if there are instances where there are multiple cats that fall from the same unit, then there's possibly a case made for, you know, a failure in, in, terms, in terms of the pet owner. Mm. So I think it's quite interesting to see that certain things like that, because it's quite different, right, from a child that is jumping off. So, so that was a comparison that was given that if a, if a child commits suicide, that cannot be the parent's fault. And you cannot say that it's their, their failure. But with an animal, I don't think that they have that same level of, like, capability mm. for them to decide I, yeah it's kind of like having a dangerous something dangerous like a like broken glass on the floor you don't sweep it up and then other people get injured Correct. I it's also your... wonder if it's just that because it's so new these new regulations on, on having cats in HDV that it will take time for the legislation to develop and for us to recognize that you know meshing up your 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 windows it's an important part of caring for it's part of your duty of care I think it will take time for the legislation yeah. to develop I have a lot of faith in the system because we are a very logical type of country <laughs> and so over time if this is what's required to keep the animal safe I think it can be interpreted into uh, the system 
Anyway, for anyone who's watching and if you have a cat, please just mesh your windows. Uh, very often people just say that it was the first time my cat fell. So don't wait, just, just do it. It's just so much easier. Okay, maybe I'll just ask one more question to end off this part about like, okay, so in, in terms of duty of care, sometimes owners will have to send their dog for obedience training or have some very strict kind of obedience training to like, and that will involve, you know, sometimes hitting or, or so so how, how do we, you know, draw that line between being abusive and training a dog to be obedient? So the research very, very clearly shows that there is no need to hit your dog for you to be able to teach your dog uh, anything. Uh, first is, what do we need to teach our dogs? Uh, do we teach them things that will keep them safe? Or are we going to teach them things for vanity, right? Like for them to be able to twirl and be able to show you certain tricks. If it is about their safety, I think recall is important for them to be able to stay, for them to be able to sit. Uh, I think those are the most important things that you need to teach. And this can be done it's been scientifically proven just through food, treats, and praise. Um, so we actually call for positive reinforcement training. Uh, we do encourage people not to look for trainers who use shock collars or any form of aversive training methods. Very often that just suppresses an animal's um, frustration. Uh, and very often that could also mean that they would snap at a time that you don't expect them to. Mm. So to begin with, there should not be such an instance. Um, unfortunately, short collars and aversive training tools are still allowed in Singapore. Uh, but if there are cases, and we do actually see a few cases being um, heard in court right now, right? Um, where they use certain tools and cause them very bad injuries, uh, whether we've, um, there was some malicious intent as well. I think you remember a case of someone saying welcome to hell to the dog and like, you know, throwing uh, a bowl at the dog. So those kind of cases that is still, I think, uh, room in the law, right, for, for those cases to be heard. I will also add that from a legal perspective, um, it is about not causing the pet unnecessary suffering. And I think the term unnecessary suffering um, is is so wide and subjective as well that uh, some people may say, you know, there's no other way. Um, this is in some schools of thought, um, causing the pet some form of pain um, is a form of or method of training. I don't believe in that. <laughs> I have never hit my pets at all. Um, I think they abuse me more than I abuse them. But um I don't abuse them at all. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think the idea of causing unnecessary suffering, that that is something that um makes it broader than just cruelty. Cruelty is under section 42, but unnecessary suffering in and of itself is is one area in which you're not allowed to cause your pet unnecessary suffering. So that actually extends to not confining your pet to small spaces, not leaving your pet out to the elements, you know, that type of thing, right? So it's actively taking steps to prevent your pet from going through suffering. And then you also have then the concept of cruelty, right? So, and, and the way it's defined is you cannot cruelly beat you cannot cruelly kick, you cannot cruelly ill-treat, that type of thing, or overdrive or overload or torture or infuriate even. You cannot do it in a cruel manner. But I think the question that then arises is what does cruelty mean? You know, because uh, to some, the, the mere act of doing something like that is cruelty, right? But I think the definition suggests that it goes above and beyond just training, um, it, there must be an intention or rather a lack of intention, intentionality in this. Okay. Um, I think maybe we can also go through some examples, uh, some questions here, because I think there was also one question that was raised about, you know, for pests, like animals that cause pests, like crows and pigeons, you know, how, how does that tie in with the law here? And, I, you know, all these pest control people, you know, going around culling pigeons, are they considered, you know, going around, you know, committing animal cruelty? Um, I don't think the um, pest control falls under that. I think there are some regulations that govern the control of the, the what you call the pest population and, and within uh, reason they are allowed to do so. But I recall seeing an article about someone who had captured live rats and was pouring boiling water on the rats um and 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 i think the i think ava was investigating it if i'm not wrong so 
I do think that you are limited in how you can dispose of these sentient beings. They are living things. They share the same space as well. So um, I do think under the Wildlife Act, there are certain exemptions made for crows, pigeons, miners, and similarly for rats. So And Singapore does have a huge problem when it comes to rats. Actually, there are two things here, right? One is uh, what is the right thing to do? And number two, what is the legal thing to do? The right thing to do is to first accept that culling does not solve the problem, right? Um, you, we've been culling for years, there are still rats, there are still birds because there's a vacuum effect. Whenever a whole group of these birds are culled, another group will just come in and they would rehouse that particular habitat. So the better thing to do is deal with the source of the problem, which is that we have a lot of food waste that we're not dealing with, we're not disposing it of correctly. So glue traps, culling, all of these things are not sustainable in the long run. But legally, are pest control operators allowed to do certain things? Yes within some guidelines. So some include that they need to be present during that particular trapping operations. They need to make sure that uh, no other species or no other animals get trapped. Very often, we do see cases of even cats or even some uh, protected animals or other wildlife getting trapped on these glue traps or into these like uh, cage traps that they have. So that uh, would mean that they have failed in their duty as a pest control operator. So they're expected to go through a training as well. Um, I think with the case of the the the, pers the two people that actually were pouring the boiling water on the rats, it was a case of taking things into your own hands as well because they felt that they reached out to the town council and you were not able to help them. So I'm not sure how far it would go because if you remember, slightly before that, there was a case of a python um, and, some, um, and somebody actually beat the python quite brutally as well. And I think you were let off with a fine, was it? Uh, a fine because they said it was about public safety, a human safety. So it's quite challenging. But I would go at it at a different angle, right? Um, I'm not comfortable with general public being allowed to handle uh, rats who carry a lot of, um, you know, possi possibly carry some infectious diseases as well. For for general public who are not trained to be able to handle these animals to mm. begin with, yeah, that's quite dangerous if you mm. ask you. Yeah, so the provision that you're referring to is under the Wildlife Act 5C. So you need the Director General's written approval. And I think that's where, you know, yeah. most of these pest control, mm. um, you know, efforts arise from. Mm. Um, another thing that came up in the webinar that was on Monday, uh, which I was moderating, actually. So now I'm on the harder end of it, I feel. Um, is that I think with, with the crow population, especially with people feeding and leaving food out, it has a knock-on effect on the rest of our uh, environment and the balance in the biodiversity. So um, the speaker then was sharing, Ganesh was sharing about how, you know, we used to see a lot of little sparrows when we were younger, but with the burgeoning crow population... Um, we see a lot less of this. So the the murder of crows has really resulted in literally like a lot of our natural species kind of being driven out. Mm. So, so I mean, there, there are always pros and cons. I think there are humane ways to to go about doing things. Um, and, and, and there are reasons why certain things are done as well. And I think we should uh, make the effort to at least understand what the biodiversity looks like and why we need to maintain that balance. Hmm. Okay, maybe we'll move on to more questions about like the whole process, you know, like prosecution and all that. So I think one of the questions that people will be wondering is like, you know, how does SPCA escalate it to NPARCs? Because we know that, you know, NPARCs is the, the authority that prosecutes and, and, and these cases. So what, how does that happen? How long does it take? You know, what are the steps and all that? Yeah. So um, the SPC has two inspectors, which is a great uh, progression from many, many years of just having one inspector. Uh, we do investigate about 900 cases of animal cruelty and abuse in a year. I think AVS does a bit more. They have mentioned on their website about 1,250 because it includes all the other feedback that comes in. The SPC doesn't have any enforcement powers. Uh, we are also, we cannot seize an animal. We cannot find someone. All we can do is, you know, try to get them to cooperate with us or collect enough evidence for us to be able to prove that there was a crime that has occurred in this particular place. So what we do is that we have a 24-hour hotline as well as um, on our website, people can actually just submit it. What we ask of people is to be able to give us as much information as you can. Very often, we get cases where people tell us that my neighbor's dog is barking. Right, but the dog can be barking for multiple reasons. So we always ask, um, you know, have you seen your 
has your neighbor come back home recently? When was the last time you saw the dog going out for a walk? Could you knock on your neighbor's door if you're friendly enough to, you know, just check in and see whether the dog is doing okay? So what happens is that uh, we try to go down to every case. In fact, I think we do go down to almost every case unless um, somebody else has already told us about that. So often with community animals, there might be a very skinny cat and then people keep telling us this cat has been abused. But we know the feeder and the feeder says this cat is sick. Um, the cat's already very old. So she's been um, already having some health issues. So we we'll go down to the case, try to get as much in, uh, information as possible and we then update this to um, AVS. Actually, a member of public can go directly to AVS as mm. well. But why we ask them to report it to us is because we have regular meetings with AVS um, and we can try to also help to, you know, um, pull in all this evidence and let them know about certain things that maybe we have been missed out by the time that they have gone down to investigate as well. Um, so that's our role. Um, in terms of the length, I think it's very, very different for every case. I also know that it's not just a situation with animal welfare, but in general, um, I think after COVID, I, I hear that courts are full and it will take a very long time for certain cases to be prosecuted. What I guess is challenging for us um, is very often that the evidence doesn't exist anymore. Right? And we don't have the powers to collect that evidence as well. So we only rely on photographs and videos. So what happens if, um, for example, Sadhana didn't take care of a dog, which of course she would uh, take very good care of a dog. But then um, by the time the, the, the authorities come there, she's changed up everything, she's made everything okay. And then Sadhana's, all right, they're going to say that, oh, she's not done anything wrong. The, the dogs look like they're in good conditions and that's that's what we see happening quite often i guess we just take heart in the fact that the dog is now living in a better mm. um condition but yeah why does it take so long sadhana tell us <laughs> I, I i actually cannot speak on behalf of yeah. uh, the authorities as well and and why it takes so long but i mean um usually investigations like i mentioned earlier i don't think it's that easy um for investigations to conclude you need very cooperative parties um, you know, some of the, the 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 pet owners may not allow you access, or they may actually be violent towards a lot of the officers that are that are uh, investigating as well. A lot of times, when you don't have video evidence, if you don't have um some form of real evidence as to the abuse, it becomes very hard because you don't have witnesses. And so investigating, talking to people, those types of things take time. And I mean, I, I read, I was looking through parliamentary debates and, and, and I think there are thousands of reports, thousands of reports coming in about what people perceive to be abuse. And I think what I feel the difficulty is, and again, I'm putting on my, my, my devil's advocate hat and I'm saying, you know, what you may think is abuse may not in legal speak be abuse it may not be legally defined as abuse and neglect you know so it becomes very hard to then proceed to prosecute on that basis because it doesn't fit within the definition as lawyers um, and prosecutors I would say we are bound by the law and we are we need to fit things into that definition in order for us to proceed and so to me I feel when you ask why it takes so long to prosecute I don't think that I mean in the, in, in an ideal world everyone will want to help everyone wants to you know prosecute especially people who are bad you know that that concept of course everybody can subscribe to that there's good there's bad right but i think a lot of the cases we see they fall in a in a very gray area right so for example you have someone who really loves the dog but thinks that beating the dog is a good way to uh, uh, sort of discipline the dog right and and when you talk to that person you can see that actually you know over the years that's what they, they've, they've been doing for all of their dogs and all of their dogs love them equally and they, they feed them they care for them but they just do this one thing mm. right so then the question is how do you proceed with this do you remove the animal does the animal then go to a shelter as opposed to staying in the house with the person who can actually provide and feed for the animal but uh, provide for the animal but you know, so so I I don't think it's as straightforward as 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 some of the more egregious cases that mm. you see. So when it comes to length of prosecution, you have cases on the extreme end, and we've seen quite a number of those. Then you have your middle grey zone, you know, uh, uh cases where it it actually takes time to prosecute and also to decide what to do in the best interests of the animal, mm. right? So I think. For me, I, 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 I think we live in that grey zone, right? We have to investigate thoroughly. Well, not we, because I don't do any investigations, but I think it's important to investigate thoroughly. In the same breath, I will say also that that 
I do sometimes feel like, why does it take so long as the person on the street? And I think having more conversations with and parks having more conversations with 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 you know SPCA as well mm. just to kind of understand what are your challenges because from 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 SPCA's perspective and and I have a a, a bit of a vested interest there mm. as well because I I sit on their board I know that they are they are staff work day in day out to try and attend to these types of cases it's not easy enforcement work is not easy they're driving down they're trying their best and sometimes they don't get access and sometimes they don't succeed mm. you know so I think that that there has to be some measure of understanding as to why these mm. cases take time mm. as well. I, I think um, as animal lovers, and of course everyone that's tuning in probably loves animals just as much as we do or even more, uh, we have a certain expected standard of care, right? Like we are investing hundreds and thousands of dollars in our, anim- in our pet's care. Um, and then there is, you know, what we all agree uh, to be a basic and then there is what the law defines as what is the minimum standards for you not to be considered uh, as somebody who neglects or is cruel to an animal. Again, it is that is the legal thing. That is the thing to make sure that you, mm. like, you know, comply with the law. But there is the humane thing. That's the right thing that we should be doing, which is really the highest level of standards. So uh, we completely empathize with the authorities. I think we know that they cannot be going out for every case of a dog barking. Maybe your dog doesn't bark uh, as often as your neighbor's dog. Uh, maybe they are going through a little bit of a challenging period. Uh, but what I guess, you know, we do hope can happen is two things. One is that the laws become a little bit more encompassing as well. I think um, we we work on very, like, uh, individual issues. But I think the Animals and Birds Act, uh, on its own, it's time for a review. It's been yeah. 10 years since it was last reviewed. And um, in 2014, when it was reviewed, it was because we accepted that we are a more gracious society. We need to move some of these controls upstream. Mm. And I think now people all the more consider pets to be a part of their family, right? Many of us actually choose to have pets instead of having children, you know, and uh, we want to care for them just like we do for all our other family members. So it's time again for us to look at it. And I think second is we need to educate people at the same time, right? Mm. So a lot of times, maybe enforcement is not the lever that we actually need to use. There are many cases where we go down, we tell people, don't cage your cats outside. It's not good for them. They will listen to us. Uh, They'll tell us what difficulties they have. Maybe it's about not enough litter boxes or these cats fight with each other. We'll try to help them out with that. So where education can be a tool, we want to use that, of course. Mm. I think, Arti, it'd be good to talk about also SPCA's efforts in its community (laughs) clinics because that's another area as well where people like, I mean, people with good hearts want to help an animal, but they don't have the resources to bring the animal to a vet, for example, or they can give it some very basic needs. But, you know, things like health care for the animal as well may not be as easily accessible. And the fix, which I felt, felt SPCA did really well about uh, on, was in its community uh, clinics as well, right? Yeah, so we do have a community animal clinic um, and in general, we see pets uh, from low-income households who do not have have the resources to be able to access veterinary care. So veterinary care has increased quite tremendously over the last few years. Um, And in some cases, people also did not sterilize their pets and then they end up having too many cats in their household so they're not able to afford that particular care. So um, the barriers to entry are very, very low. Of course, we can't do every single extensive test because this is a low-cost clinic, uh, but we are able to assist minimally with sterilization, uh, helping with any of that medical care you require. And I think more importantly and more broadly, it's that when we see such cases, um, the instinct is not that this person needs to be dealt with by the law. I think we realise that the human needs help too. Mm. Uh, Behind that suffering animal, there is a human that we need to first equip so that they can care for their pets as well. In those cases, I don't think the solution is to sort of like, you know, uh, slap a charge on them. Unless they're recalcitrant, they continue to want to keep pets when they cannot afford to. Mm. Okay, maybe one more question so that we can wrap up this section. I think I'll direct it to Sadana. Okay, both of you. I mean, we're talking about animal welfare laws are criminal in nature. What about if we feel like, you know, we want to take some civil action? Are there any civil means to pursue this against people? you know, someone we believe is being abusing, abusive to an animal? Um, I think you need to have an interest in the matter. So it cannot just be a general case of abuse. It has to be abuse of something that belongs to you. Again, we're talking about property, chattel. Um, there are several options. If you feel like NPAX is not going to proceed with prosecution, you can always make a magistrate's complaint. 
um, and frame the charge yourself. And that, that allows you to get some access to, you know, recourse on the criminal front. Um, but there's also the possibility of taking out a civil lawsuit for negligent or intentional harm. Um, and you can sue someone for damages if they injure or kill your pet, mm. right? So, for example, in the case of uh, Walker, Helen, Deborah, and Sopo Gyok, um, in that case, there was an accident involving two domestic workers while they were walking their employer's dogs. Um, it was a Tibetan Mastiff and a Labrador uh, Retriever, if I'm not wrong. Um, the Tibetan Mastiff was four years old. It was a relatively rare breed of dog and it was killed in the accident. The a Labrador Retriever, her name was Ruby, um, she was 12 years old and um, she was injured very badly. And then they relied on reports from the vet um, to say that she was suffering uh, moderate muscle loss in her hind limbs, muscular pain, etc. And so there was continuing pain um, and, and, and medical treatment that was required. And so the court awarded damages. Um, what I found was interesting was how the damages were calculated. Because um, parties didn't quite make arguments as to pain and suffering that the owner felt as a result of the dogs going through this uh, accident. What parties did was it argued based on, or rather in the court decided based on the market value approach for the dog. So the market value approach is quantifying damages based on the dog's pedigree, purchase price, general health, unique traits, and the amount of life left on the dog. Right. So um it the I mean the doors are open for um any um uh pet owner to argue that I have suffered some pain, you know, and I think I should be given some compensation for that. Um the doors are open for the pet owner to also argue for punitive damages. You need to punish them for what they've done, right? The doors are also open for the pet owner to argue for the pain that the animal suffered as mm -hmm. well. But again, it's very, very hard to quantify all mm -hmm. these things. Um, and I think th the important point to note also is that you are not entitled to a replacement amount. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if, okay, you ki killed my Tibetan Mastiff. I My Tibetan ma next Tibetan Mastiff is going to cost me 12K. Give me a replacement, right? That's not how damages are awarded. Uh, and it's not available as of right. Um, the, the claimant must show that they genuinely intend to replace the dog and that... Um, you know, um, um, the amount of life left on the dog mm -hmm. is something that, you know, can be, they can receive damages on. And I think there's a cal particular calculation for it. Um, I, I'm a lawyer, I can't do mm -hmm. math. So I, I don't know how it was calculated. But if there was like more than, less than half of uh, the dog's life left, it's one third of the amount. If it's more than half the dog's life left, it's two thirds of the mm -hmm. amount of the purchase price, apparently. So, I mean, that's my understanding of it. I, I, I don't know if this uh, if this approach is the best approach to, um, um, to take because I think the law should be looking at things from the perspective that we're dealing with living things, right? Mm -hmm. These are sentient creatures. These are creatures that feel pain. And, you know, we should not be treating them as if it's just damage to a car. Mm -hmm. You know, how much damages would you to, you know, repaint the car and yeah. fix this and that? I, I, I really don't think that that's the approach we should be taking. But in the same breath, we, I mean, if I were to look in, at, at the other side of the coin, we do quantify the lives of people who are involved in accidents as well, right? You lose a finger, you get a certain mm -hmm. amount. You lose a year, you get a certain amount. So I suppose that's what the court is also trying to do in terms of civil uh, claims. Mm. Okay, thanks, Adana, for that. I think we'll move on very quickly to our last section. And I think one of the questions that came in in the pigeonhole kind of helps us tie that in, which is because we're going to discuss about animal-related businesses. So one of the most popular questions is what are the current laws and regulations in Singapore around backyard breeding of dogs? I think that ties in with like businesses who, businesses that, animal-related businesses. And so they say that these dogs tend to be caged 24-7 and serve only for reproduction purposes. So maybe I'll get Ati. So I think uh, they would have meant breeding because backyard breeding is illegal in Singapore. So backyard breeding, of course, refers to cases where you um, keep a dog and then you want to breed them and basically you sell them. So that is illegal. You do need a breeder's license or a pet shop license in Singapore. If you know someone who's a backyard breeder, however, the process to be able to... Um, 
catch them is a lot harder because you need to number one prove that there's been a transaction so you have to make sure the person can actually transfer money to say that I want to buy this dog from you number two you need to show that breeding happened within the premises that is incredibly challenging for us to do because no one is going to allow you into their home to to come and see the puppies, right? So it's a bit hard. And there are always these adoption fees that Correct. people impose. So like there's a puppy for adoption and you just pay an adoption fee and on the front, you see like it's $100 or $200. But then later on, when you end up going into yeah. the transaction, it becomes the actual Correct. cost of the dog. And and there are also a lot of scams. But um, if you're talking about actual breeding uh, facilities, so there are, I think, about 22 such breeders in Singapore. Recently, a news article actually proved that I think about 18 or 19 out of them um, have not complied with the current licensing conditions uh, understand that a lot of them are getting advisories or probably fines and I think one or two of them would actually be prosecuted as well um, if you ask me the solution is that we have to disrupt the demand uh, because you can keep going after the breeders they are going to continue doing these things because there's a dollar value placed on an animal's life so if I am a breeder, what I care about is how can I actually continue to have as many puppies as possible and then I'm done with this breeding dog because this dog is of no value to me anymore. And very often, that's what we see. A lot of animal welfare groups have to shoulder that burden. So what we can do is to stop that demand. Uh, we need to ag agree that we all don't need to have pedigree dogs or puppies. We can adopt an animal as well. Uh, a lot of people who do it, they do it for two reasons. One, it's very difficult to adopt an animal, but rightfully so. It's a living being that we're talking about. It should be difficult for you to be able to adopt and afford an animal. Uh, number two, people always say that they want a very specific type of animal. So we need to first come out of that particular uh, stereotype that Singapore specials are not as intelligent or community cats are not as uh, loving or adorable as other animals. If you are a pet lover, uh, as far as possible, if you want to buy an animal, you are contributing to some of these unethical practices. It sounds incredibly harsh, but it is the truth. Uh, if you really do need to buy uh, a pet, then look at some of these overseas breeders uh, who have, you know, like really good certification. In fact, some of these breeders require you to make several trips down uh, to those countries to actually see the animals that you want to purchase. Uh, but as far as possible, do we need to really put ourselves into that? There's a lot of money involved as well. So short and complicated answer is do not support that business. They will eventually have to run out of business. Mm. I think the reason, I mean, if I could just jump in here, I also think the reason why people started buying smaller dogs is because of the restrictions in, in, in HDB flats. Mm. Um, certain dogs are not allowed. Dogs of certain sizes are not allowed as well. Mm. But I think the laws have progressed on this. With Project Adore, for example, there are some uh, Singapore specials that you can um, um, adopt in, in if you stay in a HDB flat. I also think that um, people subscribe to the notion that there are certain dogs that are more animal, uh, are child friendly, right? So you think like a golden retriever is more, it's gentler towards a child, whereas a Singapore special, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, mm -hmm. their temperament is all over, right? That's a, that's a misconception. You always don't know what you're going to precisely. get, whether or not, you know, it's a pedigree dog. Yeah, yeah. precisely. And I, I also feel like for, for some people, smaller dogs appear easier to manage, right? But I've also, on the other flip side, seen... <laughs> Chihuahuas get really aggressive, you know, and they got a really bad reputation. But they're very loving animals. It's just that, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to get, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is training and 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 you know, I would I wouldn't talk about training the animal. I think it's about training the, the human. owner, the human. Yeah to care for the dog and to control uh, the dog as well. Yeah. But going back to the question, sorry, I was just reading it again and it's really about what are the current laws and regulations. I won't go so much into it, but you can go to the AVS's website and you can look at licensing conditions for pet shops and breeders. They are slightly different and in uh, a, a short gist is that it includes things like how many times the dogs uh, should be walked, uh, what kind of enrichment they should be given, um, also breeding regulations where, um, that you're not allowed to breed like a, a father and a child uh, with each other or the mother and the, the pup cannot be bred together. So these are some of the things that are there. It's quite specific uh, but very often you're stonewalled because you cannot just enter a, a puppy mill and you cannot just go and say that I want to see how you breed your dogs. Even if I wanted to go in now and you know um, buy a puppy and I say that show me the mother and the father of this puppy. You can show me any two dogs mm. and I wouldn't be able to know as well. So um, it is quite challenging uh, which is why I say disrupting the demand would be the best solution mm. that all of us can you know play a part in
I think there's also some requirement for certification of the lineage of the dog, yes. especially when you, you purchase one. And there's some DNA testing that's not required wrong, that as well. It's one of the uh, commonly breached conditions as well, mm. uh, you know, in terms of making sure that uh, the lineage, yeah, they were not crossbred with their mm. parents. Yeah. Okay, maybe to wrap up this section, maybe Ati, you can bring us maybe through some practical steps as to how pet owners can check whether and safeguard, like safeguard, you know, when they en decide to engage a vendor like a groomer or pet sitter to watch their pets. How, what are some good practices that they can do to make sure that who they are engaging is properly licensed and, and properly trained to handle their pet? Um, the bad news is that there's no foolproof way right uh with groomers so so i think there's a whole bunch of services that pet owners use uh for borders and um i think for pet shops as well right like there is actually a licensing condition but even so there are many people who say that they use boarding facilities that they find to be quite dissatisfactory uh to me whether it's a border a groomer or a trainer the pet owner must be involved in the process uh, if your pet is being sent for a to a groomer, you should be able to sort of look in through a glass for you to be you know, completely assured that your, your pet is cared for. If you had a tuition teacher, would you be comfortable if the tuition teacher told you that you cannot enter the room when they're teaching your child? You wouldn't really feel that comfortable. Even for a lot of these borders, um, they usually have CCTV and they can continue to give you updates. But accidents do happen, um, you know, and I think one of the biggest challenges is how much could those accidents be prevented? In the case of uh, Fendi, the Corgi, the most upsetting thing is just less than a year before that, yet another groomer had been in that same situation. Um, you know, I think they had gone out for a break and they came back and the, the dog had passed away in almost a similar manner. So that should have already been the first sort of reminder, right? Well, when we see such things, we'll get all our stuff together, make sure like no animal is, you know, left unattended on a table of any sorts. Um, so you can't really do anything except, you know, really focus on getting good recommendations from your friends. Try to stay with, um, you know, borders or with groomers that you know very well. If you are really insecure, if you find that your pets um, don't do so well in public spaces, then spend a little bit more and get home grooming services. That's also an option that people have. There are even mobile pet, uh, mobile vets now who can come to your home and see your pets as well. Um, but apart from that, I think you have to ask all the questions uh, that necessary. Don't feel like you're being too kanchong or too kiasu by asking too many questions. I would. Uh, I want to know everything, whether they've been trained, you know, uh, how many staff they have, what is the ratio of the number of animals to each staff. Those are important things to ask as well. Okay. okay, thank you, Sadana and Ati. I think now we will take some questions from the audience. Actually, before we okay. take questions, could I just add one more thing? Because I think, you know, I, I come at things from a legal perspective, but now I'm going to take off all my hats, right? And just, you know, even if you have a, le a, a breeder who's complying with the regulations, do you really want to subject an animal purely for breeding purposes, you know, their existence is just defined by breeding. I, I have said this on public pl platforms before. I There is no space for breeding in Singapore. We, we just, we should close it all down. But I, I think really, because a lot of these animals, sure, they may be taken out for their walks and, you know, you know, they may be given adequate water, food supervision, but the sole purpose that they are there is just to breed and to produce cute puppies that you then see in pet shops. And you look at the puppy and you think, okay, this must be from an ethically sourced breeder. But really, what does it mean? What is an ethically sourced breeder, even if they comply with all the regulations? So I think it's very important to ask questions above and beyond, is this ethically sourced or is this legal? Because it may be legal and it may be ethically sourced, but is is it is it something that you subscribe to? Does this align with your values and principles as to, you know, and you if you if you if you disagree with that, then on what basis are you purchasing a dog? There's so many dogs up for adoption. I, I have a hard time with the word ethical breeding because I feel like as long as a dollar value is placed on any life, whether it was human life or animal life, I think ethics kind of go out the window at that point in time. Um, and yeah, it just really, where do your, where does your moral compass stop, right? For some of us, it is that no way. Like, I know Sadhana like, has an entire zoo in her house because you know she keeps rescuing animals. And um, there's some people who be okay. I think regardless, right, what your preferences is, it's very, very hard for us to tell people like, stop going for that labradoodle or that golden doodle, which is also very problematic because you're breeding quite incompetent 
incompatible species with each other and hoping to get an aesthetically beautiful pet that may not actually have the best of health or the best of temperaments, right? So different people have different preferences. I cannot decide. I am not given that power to decide who gets to keep a pet and what kind of pets you get to keep. All I can ask is people keep their pets as well and as happy as they can be. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Adana and Arti. So as a reminder to audiences, uh, the audience, you can still submit questions through Pigeonhole. So maybe we'll go through our first question. Um, one of the more popular ones would be, when a dog or cat consumes poison meant for culling of pigeons or crows and suffers and dies as a result, wouldn't this be a clear case of suffering and unnecessary? Who would be charged here? So I think this case must be referring to a um, recent incident uh, with Mailing Street and I think similar cases recently, right? Because there are more um, culling operations that are going on. Um, in those cases, we do understand that uh, the investigations are still ongoing. Um, if the pest control operator had failed in their duties, that means to say they were not around uh, for them to be able to you know, ensure that uh, all the baits were taken out after that, then they would be, of course, held responsible. But there's also a fear that perhaps it could have been someone who abused um, cats. There have been such cases before where people went around poisoning community cats because they were not as comfortable with them. So um, if they can actually go all the way to be able to identify that. My understanding is that there's, it's very complex because you need to do toxicology mm. reports uh, with all of the substances to make sure you can first find a common poison, mm. right? So um, the investigation is still ongoing. Mm. Yeah. I, I also think um, in the law, you must prove some degree of intention um, and at best some degree of neglect, right? So I think if they comply with all the requirements, like they were physically present, you know, they, they, they took the necessary steps to keep it out of the path of a, an animal that could be walking there. If they took all of those necessary steps, then the question is, can you establish liability? And I think that's one of the difficulties you will face because, I mean, a lot of times it's not intentional. Yeah. In, mm. in this case, I think it uh, involved about six to seven different cats. Mm. Um, so that will also be taken into consideration because if um, if indeed it was a pest control operator, how was it that you did not yeah. notice? It was there for a long enough time. Mm. Yeah, But we don't know yet whether it was a yeah. pest control operator. So moral of the story is make sure you have the evidence. Mm. Make sure that it's really good and, evidence and somehow. The people were actually really, really good. If, if this is referring to Mailing Street, but I know it's happened in a few places. I do know that the feeders in the area and I think in the pet owners, they did wrap whatever they found on the ground, they actually submitted all the evidence as well. So that is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. It's quite interesting. Um, someone asked, what happens if someone lets me adopt their pet and after seeing that the pet do better, maybe the, the pet become very cute. Lah. They, want, they want it back. So do I have the grounds to say no as I'm the pet's owner even though they bought the pet? So I will start this, but I think Sadhana has a better answer. Um, I, th I think it was shared in the previous webinar, right, that microchipping or registering your pet to you is not sufficient to prove that you are the caregiver for the animal. Uh, what is useful is, of course, for you to keep records of all the vet checks uh, for you to actually have all the medical bills, the food, all these things. You, know, you keep these receipts um, and like photographs of you bringing these and uh, your pets out for walks or for other enrichment programs and stuff. That usually is more than sufficient. So it's um, first, you must make sure still that you do the microchip microchipping and the registration don't like be that oh it's not useful so I don't want to do it. That's super important. And then the next step of course is to make sure that you can prove that you were the caregiver for this particular animal. I, I, again, I go back to intention. Um, and I think this case did come up. We were discussing it at some point. Someone was uh, uh, had an issue with why the dog was given in the first place. So if you are receiving a dog, you need to be very clear about why you're receiving the dog. Is this a temporary arrangement? Is this a permanent arrangement? You know, is and, and if you if it's in writing, that's even better, right? So a lot of times we get um, complaints that, oh, actually, I in only intended for you to take care of the dog while I was um, financially, you know, uh, unstable or I, and, I, and I wanted the dog back. That was my intention. On both sides, I would say if that really was the intention, you need to make it very clear. Secondly, I think sometimes where the intention is unclear, the court will read into exactly what Artie said, which is what are the surrounding acts that 
um, indicated that you wanted the dog back? Did you check on the dog? Did you message them to ask how the dog is doing? Did you ask to see the dog? Did you come back to walk the dog? That type of thing. All of those things would matter. And also the length of time that the dog was in the possession of the other um, party mm. as well. Um, it, it was the dog with you for very long because and if there was a contractual agreement right and some money was exchanged or you know some kind of consideration was exchanged then on you can't I mean it's no backseat you know so I think um, um but it, it it it's not as simple as it sounds because a lot of lay person doesn't think in the form that okay let me create a contract black and white in writing mm -hmm. no one thinks that way right on a day-to-day -day basis except lawyers who are a bit deranged I suppose but but when you look at these type of things you should you should be thinking what are my rights and what are my liabilities you know mm -hmm. if I take on an animal given it's a responsibility is this a responsibility I'm taking on um, for the rest of my life and if it is then I need to make it clear that this dog is mine I'm going to take active steps I'm going to go and see a vet on the regular I'm going to you know help the dog through some of its medical issues and I'm doing this with the intention of keeping the dog forever mm. so I think that kind of would signal the intention okay okay our next question uh, is about a neighbor who lets go and abandons cats whenever it matures because they're no longer cute and kittens what avenue or platform do we have in reporting such incidents? So um, the biggest challenge when it comes to reporting abandonment cases is that we don't have proof. Most people do not abandon pets in daylight. They know it's a crime in Singapore. Um, but if you do have proof, um, um, often it could be two, two, one of two things. One is that they truly abandon the pets or they let their pets free roam both of which are now illegal. So you can actually um, take photographs, videos, um, and you can actually submit this to SPCA or to AVS directly and they would be able to investigate it. So it has to be more than just sort of... Um, no, oh, I saw this cat in my, my neighbor's house and then I don't see this cat anymore. That wouldn't be sufficient. You actually need to prove that the cats are still in that vicinity or you've seen them outside. So if you have that kind of evidence, it is helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, um, we're going to go into the most, the more popular question right now, which is what legal recourse can one take if bitten by a dog whose owner brought out for a walk on a leash? And would it be different if the owner didn't use a leash? Okay, so legal recourse. Okay, first of all, right, I I, I think this, this thing about I want to sue, you know, this kind of thing, this kind of language, it, it is very onerous, you know, to go to court and to sue and, and, and to claim, you know. So I, I do think the first step shouldn't be legal recourse, right? It should be an active discussion um, with the other pet owner. And and I will be candid, I have been bitten by dogs who are on, on leash. My dog has been bitten by another dog who was on leash. And generally when I exchange numbers and then I go to the vet for my dog and then for myself, I, I, I try to see a doctor. It's actually cheaper to see a doctor than it is to go to the vet, you know. It's insane. But anyway, so I, I, I do reach out to the owner and they're generally quite reasonable Um, and, and they offer to pay, right? So that's the first thing, right? So at first instance, just remember, it's always cheaper to talk it out and, you know, mediate amongst yourselves than to go to court. To file one paper already, you have to pay money, okay? So it's not, it's not, it's not cheap. But there are um, certain options available if the other party is not um, um, cooperative. It doesn't mean that the other dog will automatically get put down. Okay, so I just want to highlight that. The second thing is you can you can claim for damages, like basically. So any type of injury or or or, or um pain that you've suffered, right? You can claim for that. Again, the process of establishing that is very long. So again, just 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 talk it out, right? You can claim for things like um if you end up being hospitalized, if you end up uh, uh having some sort of medication that you have to be on the long term. And I'm not minimizing. I know that certain types of dog bites can be fairly serious, you know, and can result in in quite serious complications to a person's health. So in those cases, sure, I think legal recourse can be explored, but I do think that um um in order to proceed on that, you need to show again causation that that dog bite resulted in this um, injury and it's resulted in these long term implications. So you can you can sue, um, and you can claim for damages. Um, I suppose it also boils down to what do you want as the outcome. Uh, so if you want the person to stop 
um, not leashing their dog, making sure that they leash their dog and everything. So it is an offence to off-leash your dog. Um, there is a fine, I think, that you would get. Um, and then, of course, if, if it continues to happen, then the authorities may come in and may take on, uh, take more serious causes of action. So I suppose it's important as the owner, is it that you want to be compensated? Uh, then I think the easiest thing to do is to speak to the person, make sure that you can give them the bills and they commit to paying those bills. But we also see cases where uh, the the owner of the dog then goes MIA on the person and things like that. So I would do what you would do in a car accident, right? Like you take down all the details that you have, you take down the damages, everything, and you keep all of the information. Then you can make a decision whether you want to settle this through your insurance or through private settlement uh, and if neither of that works out then of course that's where you get the police involved okay i think we'll answer one of the another question about ownership about pet sitters are they considered owners during the time the pet is left in their care even though they are paid so i think that's quite simple maybe sadana can actually given that i've already gone through what the requirements are to be considered and owner of the pet, I'm going to test RT. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask RT to answer this question. So, um, pet sitters would be considered, right? Like, there is a certain duty of care. But again, this is an unregulated business. Um, so, if you were to ask the authorities, so it would be very, very challenging because what code of animal welfare do mm. they comply with? Um, so, if they had caused any harm to the animal. So it, it really depends again on what you are you are unhappy with. Is it that your your pet came back and then the, the ear is like, you know, clipped entirely or you know your dog comes back malnourished and and uh, stuff like that then of course you know you can you can go um, and 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 report them uh, but if you're saying that you're unhappy because they didn't like keep uh, your dog separate from the other two or three dogs it's an unregulated business they have no licensing conditions at this point yeah. so I mean very well done, RT. 100 marks for you. Um, and in fact, I think RT is the one who educates me a lot more about all of these things. But I think the, the key thing that we we highlighted earlier is also if you even in the course of employment, um, you have temporary custody of a dog, it can give rise to a duty of care. Um, and that duty that's placed upon you is, is, is onerous, you know. It's not just like, oh, duty of care, what does it mean, right? You're supposed to give the dog water, food, etc. So there are, there are several positive duties that are imposed upon you. But even if, you know, let's just say it's difficult to establish the duty of care or it's difficult to establish that they are the dog is in their custody, there is also a positive duty to not abuse, right? So even if they you cannot establish the first argument under section 41c i think they can go to section 42 which is do not cruelly treat the animal right don't beat don't don't abuse you know and subjecting mm. it to unnecessary treat like cutting of the ears and stuff mm. like that if the animal comes back with some kind of bruise or cut i think that's something that you could try and um um, um look at under section 42 mm. okay i have a very interesting question um wait let me sorry let me um Oh, I lost, lost that question. Oh. Okay, but okay, the question is, during the process of investigation, can we, can the authorities request for the animal to be placed under like foster care? So, so you know, like, like child abuse, then you get, you, you, you transfer the child to a... So I, I do think this is where organizations like SPCA and other animal welfare groups come into play. Um, so what we would try to do is to convince the authorities or speak with them and let them know that I think you know this uh, animal should not be staying with them. So there are some cases where the authorities will actually have to confiscate the animal. They have the powers to do that. Uh, it's a fairly complex process, but they will only use this if they feel like that animal is going to be in uh, more pain and suffering at that point in time. Um, and then uh, if they feel like there needs to be more long-term housing for that particular animal, they may actually ask the SPCA or any other animal welfare group whether they would like to continue taking over that care until the investigations are over. Um, this is usually for cases, for example, we have one dog with us um, who was severely neglected. You could see his rib cage, um, and you know, the owners were claiming to feed him, uh, but then when the uh, when the dog actually uh, came to us, we realized that it wasn't a case that the dog had a health issue because the dog fattened up very, very quickly after that. So the authorities worked with us. They told us to, you know, first temporarily hold on to the animal. And then once the investigations were over, the dog is actually up for adoption now. So that's a possibility. But I don't think you get to ask the authorities. I think it's more for the authorities to determine whether or not this animal should be uh, placed in temporary care. Hmm. Okay. 
Okay, an interesting question is, are vets, because we're talking about animal-related businesses, are vets subjected to regulations similar to medical practitioners, subject to Medical Registration Act, and ensures registered medical practitioners uphold standards of practice? I, I, I don't think there are any such regulations that uh, apply, right? There is a vet council that is being formed up. Um, I do think that there's a bit more regulation now because people have also um, uh, raised it. Just to be clear, right? So if they do cause unnecessary pain and suffering, they are also mm -hmm. liable um, in, in the act, right? But I think what people are asking for is a bit more structure and guidelines and governance. Um, I do understand that the Veterinary Association, um, they exist already. Um, I think they are more a membership body. Uh, they do try to spread some good practices as well. But the Vet Council will be uh, starting and yes, there's also a code for them. So codes, um, you will hear the word code use, being used a lot in animal welfare, right? It's a code of animal welfare for pet owners, for pet businesses. Now there's a code of ethics for vets. Uh, these codes are not legally enforceable, but if you have committed an act under 41 or 42, then breaches of the code can actually be used as evidence as well. Mm. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the code of uh, ethics and I think you can find that very quickly online um, under the Singapore Veterinary Association and I think it was this the code of ethics was released I think about February 2012 and it it pertains to a lot of things um, things like euthanasia for example um, cosmetic procedures ear cropping tail docking decloying etc it's not clear when the last time this was updated. Uh, there is also but... licensing conditions for vets, right? Just as there are for doctors as well. Um, so they would need to first... And, and there, there are yearly checks as well. I think it's more from a biosecurity point of view mm -hmm. more than anything, right? Like, But the authorities do come to in inspect. Even our clinic gets inspected on a yearly basis to make sure that all the drugs are stocked correctly um, and we have come across a few cases um, where people actually have alleged um, neglect or abuse on the part of the vet and we do know that the authorities have gone down to investigate those cases as well. There, there are also, I mean in the code of ethics that the SVA released, there is also the option of making a complaint to the SVA and then they will convene a council um, and the, there will be a committee hearing to to see whether the complaint is is, is valid. Um, and they can be expulsed. Uh, I, I mean, the, there's an expulsion type yeah. uh, mechanism. I, I just think that the only thing is that the Singapore Veterinary Association, if I'm not wrong, is not a governing body. Yeah. Um, it's more like an association, right? So like me and Sadhana now can start a, a no breeders mm. association, but at the end of the day, you just get expelled from mm. my association. Mm. Uh, but you can still continue to practice, right? Mm. So the AVS licensing conditions will still be the most important. Uh, but I do know that this is a challenge that a lot of people have raised. I think not just about um code of conduct, but I think also about the pricing, right? Like people have been asking whether there could be some kind of ceiling mm. uh, because prices are skyrocketing. I do empathize with the vets though because it is very, very hard to get manpower. Um, I think that is the biggest crunch that they are facing at this juncture. And um, I think in Singapore, we're actually quite lucky because a lot of vets do care about animal welfare. They do help community animals as well. Um, so some structure will be helpful, but we shouldn't uh, you know, automatically determine that vets are like the, the evil, right? They are not because they're here to help our animals also. Mm. I, I think you can also, if you have an issue with a vet, you can also complain to NPARCs and they will, especially if it's, some form of professional conduct mm. you can complain to end parks but I think the laws that govern such complaints are very similar to what you have in the ABA anyway uh, which is cruelty and neglect mm. and stuff yeah. like that yeah okay we have two questions one on um, you know where can we find more guidelines on what animal cruelty entails and what's being done to educate the public you know are there any resources that our listeners can 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 refer to in terms of like um, expected standards of care and um, so I, I feel like there's two very important sites one is of course looking at the animals and birds like as it's uh, on its own uh, I know some people may feel that it's a lot to read it's actually quite a a uh, good read I must say it's not too complicated we can understand there are three key laws there section 8 which is about smuggling of animals then there's 40 
one and 42 as well. Um, the second is really the AVSS website has a lot of information on it. Uh, you shouldn't just focus on the resources for pet owners, but you can also look at the resources for pet businesses, even though you're not starting one. So when you go in there, you'll be able to see the codes, you'll be able to see the licensing conditions um, and you know all the other, uh, for example, if you're going to have animals at a particular event, then you need to apply for an animal exhibition license. All those things will be available on their website. So I strongly encourage um, everyone who has a pet, who's planning to get a pet to access these resources. Then there's the SBCA's website as well that has a lot more on animal welfare advocacy. So if you want to know things about like breeding, um, know why we find it to be unethical, uh, pet care, then you can refer to the SBCA's website. Can I also do a plug for Pro Bono SG as well? You know, we have our logo where... Um, which will contain quite a bit of information on animal welfare issues and what you can do as well. Um, it will also contain webinars like or links to webinars like these, which can then help to inform your understanding of these issues as well. So do go to one of our uh, to to logoware, which is one of our the websites that we run. Thank you, thank you for your responses. We are sadly out of time, so maybe I would like to invite each of you to sh share one key takeaway from today's discussion. Oh, you go so, first. <laughs> me first. Um, I guess I would just repeat this, right? Like there is the law and then there's the, the right and the humane thing to do. Um, and we really should not be just looking at um, doing things for animals because it is the legal thing to do. Uh, animals are just as deserving of our respect, our compassion, our care. Uh, we share the universe, we share the responsibilities. So I think let's not just focus on what is legal, let's focus on what is humane and what is right and what is compassionate. I think for me, I mean, what RT said is so powerful, which is as a lawyer, I, I, I am bound by the technicalities, right? The, what are the definitions? What does the law provide? What um how can I prove something or how can I disprove something? So the law is one aspect of it, but as a human being and as someone who cares very deeply for animals, you will also have a responsibility as well. And that's above and beyond what the law can provide. And I think apart from caring for animals and 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 being aware and interested in the factors surrounding their welfare, it's equally important to be vocal about it. I think speaking up is so critical. Um, a lot of times we think that they are, you know, we've been advocating for animal uh, welfare and, and issues surrounding animal welfare uh, for a very, very long time. And I think where we struggle sometimes is we, people don't see it as something that's important, something that should be high up on their list of things, right? There's all these bread and butter issues, oh, COVID, this and that, right? And then animal welfare issues kind of just sometimes may take a back seat. But I think it's important for you to speak up if you feel that something is um, 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 pressing, something needs to be addressed. I, I said this once as in passing as a joke, but I think, you know, sometimes when your MP walks around and knocks on your door, then you're like, hey, don't open, don't open, you know, <laughs> you don't want to talk to the MP, right? Why? Open the door, talk to your MP, let them know that this is something that's affecting you, it's troubling you, ask them questions and, and let them know that this is something that's important to you as a Singaporean. I think that's so important because they are, that the conversations that need to be had are probably what is going to lead to the greatest change, you know, and it, it cannot just be, oh, SPCA is doing it or animal welfare groups are doing it. Let them fight the fight. You know, it, it's not, that's not it. As a collective, we need to do more. And I think the second, uh, the second key takeaway is support. I think a lot of the animal welfare groups, they're just looking for support, whether it's financial support or manpower or even just spreading the word. It's so important. Like, look, the pin I'm wearing is an SPCA pin. She's also wearing it, you know. And it's in all these little things that you're doing that kind of raise, raises awareness on some of the broader broader issues that animals are facing in Singapore. I could, sorry, I know we had one key takeaway, but since Sadhana yes. broke the rule, I would too. I just want to <laughs> add on to the role of um, the conversation about support. I think even if you don't support, don't discourage the people who are trying. Uh, very often, we see a lot of like, you know, comments, right? Um, 
it's so easy to comment. I realize now this, I even try not to look at some of this, but it's like, oh, uh, anyway, as we say, it's not going to do anything about it. I mean, I wish, right? Like, um, there are always these jokes that are made that like, oh, give Ati like, you know, the powers and then she's going to put everybody into jail. I promise I will never do that by <laughs> the powers. Um, but we are trying with what limited resources that we have um, you know and we are willing to go all out but there are challenges and if you want to speak to us about the challenges we are happy to uh, but it's very very painful when um, especially our staff and our volunteers when they work with animals every day they see the worst of uh, humanity you know what humanity can do to an animal and then come back and also have to face that kind of resentment uh, it is challenging so try to help us if you can if not at least try to resist the urge you know to criticize the people who are trying actually can i just share this very quick story about uh, a dog that i wanted to adopt from spca yes. um bell uh he was abandoned at the spca uh and he was very old and it was the impression that was given was that he uh, was lost and someone just wanted to turn him in but actually his owner had turned him in and um, I think he was already doing very badly but I think what heartened me to see was just the way that the 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 the, the people at the SPCA were just taking care of him I mean his life mattered you know even towards the end they, they cared for him they gave him the necessary medication and we were supposed to bring him home on Christmas but he passed away on Christmas Eve and even then we gave him a really good send-off like we sent him off you know mm. gave him he was cremated we, we we scattered his ashes and we gave him a good send-off and I think the value of that just the work that 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 animal welfare groups I'm not just plugging for SPC I mean everybody is going through a hard time when we see animals being abused and it's we we see some of the harder to swallow aspects of humanity right and so when when and I, when i say we i'm being very generous to myself i don't do this day in day out these guys do it day in day out you know and it's difficult and it can be depressing and so like what rt said you know if if we can't encourage them let's not discourage them but more importantly let's encourage them let's give them some strength i must say sadhana them. left out a very important part of that story is that bell had passed away but sadhana and her family uh, still did the formal adoption papers after her death um so that bell, uh, his death so that bell did not pass away uh, without an owner Thank you very much. I think I think the key is, you know, animals also deserve to have some dignity to be treated like a living thing, yes. <laughs> right? Okay. We have come to the end of this webinar. Um, and um, next week on Monday, 23rd of September, at the same time, 7.30, um, there'll be another webinar, Discover the Startling startling statistics and hidden realities behind closed doors as we shine a light on the pervasive problem of family violence. Um, learn how to identify warning signs and gain practical strategies for prevention, intervention, and support. By raising awareness and fostering understanding, we can empower individuals, families, and communities to take a stand against family violence. Join the moderator, Go Tianhui, and speakers Dama Jayaram and Christine Lam as they provide invaluable insights into the root causes, dynamics, and impact of family violence. Explore effective communication techniques, conflict resolution strategies, and resources available to break the cycle of abuse. Together, let's be the solution and create a safer, more compassionate world for everyone. These are these and many more webinars are part of Law Awareness Week at CDC 2024. You can scan the QR code or visit the website go.gov.sg slash law-cdc to register for this webinar or the many more webinars available. At the end of this webinar, a survey form will pop up on your screen for completion. We appreciate your comments as it will be useful for to help us improve future webinars. Lastly, if you find that you require legal guidance on your legal issues after today's fantastic sharing, do write to help at probono.sg. We would like to express our gratitude to Sadana and Arti for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And with that, on behalf of Pro Bono SG, we would like to thank all of you for joining us today and have a good week ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.